My goal here is to give you a sense of the pace of change, the opportunities, the challenges, but where we're going, not in 20 or 30 years, this decade. I think one of the things we don't realize is that we haven't seen 1% of the rate of change we're going to see in these next 10 years. And the opportunity for that is extraordinary because it used to be that a thousand years ago, the only people who could change a nation or region of the world were the kings and the queens. A hundred years ago, it was the industrialists, the robber barons. Today, it's anyone. Anyone passionate enough is given access to these exponential accelerating technologies can take on the world's grand challenges and I believe solve them. I'm executive chairman, co-founder of a university called Singularity University. It's seen here. We're backed by by Google, by 3D Systems, by Deloitte, by Genentech, by Cisco. Our mission as a university is to give the top graduate students and executives from around the world an understanding of what's in the lab today and coming to market in the next two, five, ten years on these converging exponential technologies. Because these technologies are those that can, are the levers, if you would, to impact a billion people. And we talk about the fact that today an entrepreneur, and we, we cultivate about 15 startups a year out of SU, an entrepreneur can actually start a company that impacts a billion people in a decade. You'd have to have been Mutar Kent at Coca-Cola or Jeff Immelt at GE or someone of that magnitude to actually impact a billion people before today. An individual can do this. And we teach, you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. We talk about exponential technologies. It's our mantra. And I want to begin by saying that we are all local and linear thinkers. We evolved on a world in which the world around us was local and linear. Nothing affected you that was not within a day's walk. And the life of your great-grandparents, your parents, you, your kids, 100,000 or a million years ago was the same. Nothing changed, generation to generation. But today, things are changing year to year. We're living in a world that's global and exponential. The question is, what does exponential feel like? Right? If I say to you, I want you to take 30 linear steps, you know, one, two, three, four, five, all of us are great linear projectors. I'm saying, I'm there in five linear steps, there in 10, 30 linear steps, I'm across the hall, 30 meters away. But if I say to you, where are you going to be in 30 exponential steps? You know, an exponential being a simple doubling, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Very few people will say in, a, in, you know, in 30 exponential steps, I'll be a billion meters away. Put differently, I will have gone around the planet 26 times. And that difference between us thinking linearly while the world that you're creating, that you're using, the technologies, are growing exponentially is really the story here. You see this red line here? It's all of us. It's our politicians. It's our shareholders. It's our customers. We haven't had a hardware or software upgrade in 50,000 years. It's been a while. <laughs> the yellow line is the technology you're using and creating. It's networks and sensors, AI, robotics, 3D printing, all of these areas. And the difference between these two is interesting, right? Because if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and some kid in the garage comes up with this disruptive new service or business model, it's disruptive stress. If you're the kid in the garage, it's disruptive opportunity. We grew up with Kodak being one of the mainstay brands of the world. And in 1996, at the top of their game, Kodak is a $140,000, $28 billion company that 20 years earlier had invented the digital camera. A guy I'll introduce you to in a moment had come up with it in the lab. And you can imagine when he brings it to his board of directors, he goes, here it is, the digital camera, right? It takes 0 0.01 megapixel images. They say, what are you kidding? That's a toy for kids. We're Kodak. We make beautiful, high-resolution images. Besides, we're in the paper and chemicals business. And of course, in 2012, Kodak declares bankruptcy effectively disrupted by the very technology that they had invented, but didn't understand what exponential growth would look like. But what's interesting is in the same year of 2012, another company, also in the digital imagery business, a company called Instagram gets acquired by Facebook. But they've got 13 employees and get a billion dollar valuation. The difference between a, if you would, exponential company and a linear one is this kind of disruption. I've given it a new name. I, I call it the new Kodak moment. <laughs> We're going to see this over and over again. Projecting forward a continuation of Moore's Law, you know, in 2010, five years ago, if you remember back then, you know, the average computer was calculating at 100 billion calculations per second, which 
you know, is more computational power than we had in the entire US space program in the 60s and 70s. In 2023, eight years from now, now the average $1,000 computer you go down to the store and purchase is calculating at 10 to the 16th cycles per second, which is just a number, unless you speak to a neurophysiologist who tells you that's the rate at which your visual and auditory cortex does pattern recognition. So what happens when a thousand bucks buys you the computational power of a human brain? And of course, it doesn't stop there because 25 years later, now a thousand bucks buys you the computational power of a human race. This is going to be transforming almost every industry. I want to share, if you would, the kinds of technologies we teach at Singularity University that we study, that our students start companies on, that are converging and changing the world. And they are you know, robotics and AI and 3D printing and networks and sensors. And these technologies, what's most important about them is that they're democratized technologies. They're accessible almost to everybody. So a kid in Mumbai on a smartphone has access to more cloud computing power, if you would, than, the, than you know, the chairman of MIT had 20 years ago, and access to more knowledge and information than President Clinton had 20 years ago. It's an extraordinary democratization that's going on. One of the most powerful technologies coming online, let me speak about some of these, is artificial intelligence. And AI is the ability of a computer to understand the language nuance, to be able to understand the, you know, the cynicism, the humor, the confusion you have, and give you an answer. We may know it as Siri on our iPhone as the earliest days. I like to think of Jarvis from Iron Man as my preferred version of, of AI. What happened two years ago was Michael Roden, who, was the, who is the head of the Watson program at IBM. Watson had just, uh, IBM had just built the Watson supercomputer. And they wanted to show how powerful this was as an artificial intelligence. And so they decided to challenge the top two Jeopardy champions, the guy who had won the most money and the guy who had won the most number of games. And if you don't know the game of Jeopardy, it's a, it's a difficult game that you ask, basically make a statement and have to ask the right question. It's a game of, of context and understanding. And I want to show you a short video clip showing you a supercomputer, Watson, demolishing his human opponents or its human opponents. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Watson? Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. Watson? What is Crete? Yes. So what was Watson? And first of all, this is so two years ago. <laughs> right? <laughs> Watson was a room-sized computer of you know, the size of this stage, if you would, some 3,000 uh, Power 7 core processors, able to process a million books per, per minute, able to literally download Wikipedia. It was not hooked up to the internet. It had downloaded Wikipedia in a number of databases and was able to pull relevant pieces of information far more than our memories can, can withhold. But what's interesting is where IBM has taken this. So since then, over the last two years, IBM has ported Watson to the cloud and has put an open API, basically, <clears throat> an interface for entrepreneurs to create services on top of Watson. So where is Watson going first? To medical school. They've downloaded into it all the relevant journals, all the relevant information, and Watson is able today to diagnose cancer better than any physician can. Because medicine is far more than anything you can hold in your mind with all of the lab tests that we run. There's no way that a human can withhold in their minds that level of information. But here's the notion. Today, as we go towards this future, anyone with a cell phone can call Watson and ask a question. This is the democratization not of information, like Google may be, but the democratization of knowledge, of answering questions. And we're going to see a number of companies, every major IT company, heading in this direction. So what's next? Next, I'm going to talk about sensors. This is that guy at, at Kodak who came up with the digital camera. Here you can see it. You can imagine walking into the boardroom of Kodak and seeing the future of Kodak and, and the reaction. And so 0 0.01 megapixels, 10,000 bucks, four pounds. Today, here's today's digital camera, right? 10 megapixels, you know, a couple of bucks. This is a billion times better. The question is, it doesn't stop here, right? We haven't reached the pinnacle of cameras. Where is it going to be in 10 years when it's 1,000 times better? 
20 years when it's a million times better? 30 years when it's a billion times better? Will it be high definition cameras woven into your clothing and micro drones in the air? I want to give you a sense that sensor technology is exploding, right? My friends at Cisco talk about the internet of everything, that we're heading towards a, you know, 12 billion connected devices today, 50 billion by 2020, and those connected devices, each with a dozen sensors, we're heading towards a trillion sensor economy where effectively in the near term, you're going to be able to know anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you want. This is the first inertial measurement unit. This is what got us to orbit, got us to the moon. Tens of millions of dollars, tens of pounds, able to you know, measure velocity accelerations. Where is it today? It's a buck on your phone. So where is it going next? Molecular in size, woven into everything we manufacture, every cell phone. This is the first GPS. $120,000, 53 pounds. Imagine this thing on the dashboard of your car, <laughs> right? So the notion is that these sensors are exploding and we have a bias to believe this is the best it gets. This is where it is today. It's gonna be a thousand times better in 10 years. How's that gonna change your businesses? What is possible? This is Google's autonomous car. And what people, what, what most don't understand is the domino effects that these technologies have. So what does an autonomous car mean? It means, first of all, that you stop building roads because you can put eight times as many cars on a road. You don't need parking garages or parking lots or driveways because you don't have a car anymore. It drops you off. You order a Ferrari on Friday night when you have a date. You order an SUV on Saturday night when your in-laws are over. You use the car that you need when you need it. I have two three-and-a-half-year-old boys at home the chances are they will never have to drive. And so what happens to Detroit or whatever car industry center you want when people don't buy cars, they use them on demand. And by the way, if cars don't crash, you need automotive insurance anymore. So a lot of implications that people don't talk about. And because you know, driving an autonomous car is, anybody driven one of these cars here? I know you have Matt red. So I'm going to show you what it feels like to drive in one of these cars. We took a team of people over to Google from XPRIZE on our adventure trips, and I want to show you what it looks like on a slalom course inside one of these cars. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 oh. oh my god. The implications are extraordinary, right? There are countries in the world which have a tremendous mortality rate from teenagers driving, from young men driving. This changes the game. Another technology that's going to be transforming our lives and disrupting a $10 trillion industry is 3D printing. Full disclosure, I'm on the board of 3D Systems. And the ability of 3D printing to print anything layer by layer by layer out of 300 different materials. In any level of complexity you want, any level of personalization, you don't have to manufacture overseas anymore. You manufacture in your closet or down the street. And the manufacturing of multiple materials. This is a person who forgot their wrench and can hit print and print a wrench if you would. So what can we print these days? Here is a polygon within a polygon, just showing a simple structure you can print where complexity comes for free. In China last year, for the first time, we saw the construction of 10 3D printed homes in 24 hours for $5,000 each. Last month, a 3D printed apartment building out of China. This is a person who lost their right lower limb, scanned their left limb, flipped the image, and 3D printed a prosthetic composite replacement. This truly is just the beginning of a disruption in manufacturing. The uh, final technology I want to talk about is synthetic biology and genomics. I had the pleasure in March of this year, March of last year, to announce a new company with Craig Venter and Bob Hurry. Craig, who sequenced the first human genome, and Bob Hurry, who's one of the top leading stem cell scientists from CellGene, we created a company called Human Longevity, Inc. We've now built the largest genome sequencing facility on the planet. We're going to be sequencing between one to five million genomes in the next four years. And our goal is to create the largest impact on human health and to extend healthy living 
by 30 to 40 years this decade. That's our mission, that's our goal. We are creating in one of the largest databases a collection of full phenotype data, the full genome, the 3.2 billion letters from your father and from your mother, the haplotype phasing. But besides that, your microbiome. So each of us are a collection of 10 trillion human cells and 100 trillion bacterial cells. And so that full bacterial complement of DNA as well, full body MRI, metabolome, and the proteome. And all that information goes in and we've brought into the company a guy named Franz Ock who ran Google Translate. And we are basically doing massive machine learning on top of this information to understand because it's our belief that your genomics actually describe how you look, how you sound, every aspect of your life. First of all, I hope you can feel the only constant is change. And the rate of change is increasing. And one of my mantras for large companies is either you disrupt yourself or someone else will. Standing still is no longer an option. The other thing to realize is that your competition is no longer the multinational overseas. It's the entrepreneur in a garage with access to 3D printing, AI, robotics, who's willing to take risk after risk, failure after failure, and go shot on goal. And so we have a generation of entrepreneurs that are empowered with more technology than the largest governments and corporations had 20 years ago. We are de facto linear thinkers. And my challenge to you is what's your moonshot? How do you go 10 times bigger, not 10% bigger, in your country, in your company, and in your own personal life? Because these things are now possible. We have the magic of these technologies. This is perhaps one of the most important things. This is the world's population. We're at 7 billion, just over 7 billion. Internet connectivity. In 2010, we had 1.8 billion people connected online. The projection for 2020 is that by 2020, we're going to reach 5 billion people online, which means we have 3 billion new minds entering the global economy. 3 billion people who have never bought anything. 3 billion people who have never, you know, have never uploaded or downloaded or used the internet. But what's interesting, in fact, in the last month, is the following. So there are now a number of ventures looking to connect not 5 billion, but all 7 billion humans on this planet with a megabit connection. So Mark Zuckerberg's been talking about and buying drone companies and looking at spacecraft. Google has had their project Loon, which is to connect using balloons and using, again, uh, uh, drones. Last week, Elon announced then with a follow-on with a, with a billion dollar investment from Google, a 600 plus satellite constellation for providing megabit connections. And also, my friend Paul Jacobs, in partnership with Richard Branson and, Jeff and Greg Weiler, have announced themselves a multi-hundred satellite constellation. We have two mega constellations going up to provide megabit connections. So what happens when we don't have five billion people, but seven billion people connected online? These three to five billion new consumers if they're not your customer, they're your customer's customer. And they represent tens of trillions of dollars coming online. But they also represent one of the greatest eras of innovation ever. I'll close with another fun example near and dear to my heart. In our solar system, we have access to abundant resources beyond our imagine. So this is an asteroid. And in the last 12 years, there have been discovered a set of asteroids that come very close to the Earth that are abundant in fuels abundant in metals, abundant in platinum group metals. And these asteroids, this is just one example. This is UW-158. And when you look at its value in terms of fuels for use in space and platinum group metals or metals for use in space or on the ground, the value is $5 trillion. We're living in a world where I believe there is little we cannot accomplish that we're heading towards a world where entrepreneurs can transform and solve grand challenges. And this is perhaps the most exciting time ever to be alive. An honor, a pleasure. Thank you very much.